Just to say welcome to everybody. Uh, it's a fantastic time so far. I don't know about you, but um, already I feel if I went home now, I would have been enriched with what God's been doing. I'm not quite sure what he has been doing. That's the thing. But I know he's doing something. And I guess we're just partway through that journey. And our prayer is that this afternoon um, that you will hear something from God that will propel you forward in the prophetic. We're all in completely different stages with this. I feel I've got huge L plates on, hugely a baby in this whole thing. Um, and I just hope that as we share something from our own journeys, that it will help you. Um, I know it's a cliche to say we're journeying together, but I just want to say up front, I genuinely am journeying in this, this whole process. So um, Dave is going to start off by doing some general things about good practice of the prophetic and how it's harnessed with other gifts. It's the bigger picture. And then I'll be following with more of the detail, more nitty gritty, a bit more um, personally challenging maybe about where you are. Um, can I recommend that... Um, you have either a notebook and a pen with you or an iPad or somewhere where you can take notes. Not that we've got any great wisdom to share with you, but that we expect God to speak to you this afternoon. Um, and we want you to just jot down what you feel God is saying if you hear anything at all from heaven in what we share with you. So can I just pray and then Dave's going to come and speak first. Father, we do lay ourselves open to you. We, in one sense, do not want the waiting to stop because we're in a seminar. Lord, we want this to be a time when our ears are in tune with what you want to speak into our lives, both individually and corporately. Lord, we lay ourselves before you and we say we want to grow more. We want to be more mature in the gifts and graces and ministries that you have given to us. And we just pray, Father, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, drop something into us today that will be significant. That as we go out of this place, we will be carrying something afresh to discover and explore and journey in. Father, we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Jeff has put together a presentation that we'll go through. Um, are we working it from the back or the front? Okay. Advancing in the prophetic. I like the title. About 40 years ago, uh, I made a decision, maybe 45 years ago, which was not to work apostolically without being harnessed to prophets. Now, I don't want you to get confused at the beginning. We've got people in here who can prophesy. That's a gift. We've got people in here who are emerging to the next level where they're bringing prophetic directional ministry. And we've got people who've progressed beyond that to being fully recognized in the office of the prophet. And the three things are very different. But each has the capacity to morph into the next thing. But we have to discover what the levels are that we operate in. And how many of you would say you've received a gift from the Lord of prophecy? Over the years, okay, that's, that's good. How many of you are leaders here coming to check up on your naughty prophets? Okay, that's good. So there's less suspicion here than in most places. But we want to get a hold of something today, which is called understanding. We have to understand what the gift is or the ministry is that God's given to us in order to advance. We have to understand what it is that we have to develop and we have to understand who we should be working alongside in order for that gift or ministry to be developed. It doesn't happen in splendid isolation. And one of the problems that we have when we're handling the prophetic is most of the prophets that I've worked with over the last 40 years or so have a problem with isolation, have a problem with independence, have a problem with rejection, have a problem with fear and insecurity. And so normally for many of them, it's hard for them to get connected. But God's looking for connections in these days in a way that we've never known in the past. So 
we're working from a point of thinking team. Everything we'll be saying to you is to do with how you bring what you have to the table in order to be part of a team that produces something at the end of the day which is far greater than what you can bring on your own. Are we okay? Okay. So we're advancing in the prophetic. So we have to learn to handle what we've received. How many of you got kids? How many of you know it was one thing receiving them, it was another thing learning how to handle them? Well, it's like that with a gift. You know, you, you kind of learn by trial and error. You learn as you're going along and you learn particularly from the scriptures. One of the first things that I've learned is this. If we look at understanding, can we keep moving it on? If you're following through with me, Jeff will keep it with you. The first point will be this, understanding our level of gift and ministry. And the two things are different. The gifts of the Spirit are different from the offices or the ministries that the Lord gave when he went to heaven and sent down the Holy Spirit. And these three scriptures are really important. We all have to understand we've been given by the Lord a measure of grace, a measure of faith, and a measure of sphere. And when we understand that, it makes life very easy. Now look, when, when we first started off in Whitney, somehow in the worship, I got involved in playing the guitar. My guitar playing was so bad. Unlike John Gridley, who's very, you know, skilled and able to perform, I used to mime a lot of the more difficult chords. And there were other people, musicians, who could actually cover that and compensate for it. I was all right playing in our living room. I would have been terrible if you'd have put me on this stage. My level of grace was the first three, four years of that church developing. And one day Barney said to me, I don't want you to do that anymore. I don't want you to lead the worship. I'd written songs, some of which had gone around the world, but he didn't want me to do it anymore. And he suggested that Jeff should leave it. And I, 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 to be honest, it was one of the funniest comments Barney ever made. Because Jeff was not musical. Jeff didn't play an instrument. But actually Jeff could move in the spirit. And so he would know what would come next. And so he led the worship like that for several years afterwards. And I was moved into another area where I had a measure of faith, where I had a measure of grace, and where I had a sphere that began to develop. And that's very important. You mustn't think of yourself too highly, and you mustn't think of yourself too lowly. I'll read it to you in Romans 12. Once we've got past this place, we're in a place where we can begin to work together. But we have to come to this place first. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, I had to realize I was never going to be a rock legend with a guitar. I did not have that capacity, and the sooner I accepted it, the better. I had to know what was it that God had set me aside for and gifted me to do. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, and what is acceptable, and what is perfect. For, by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we many members, and the members don't have all the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith. You see how these are coming together? Measure of gift, measure of grace, measure of faith. If service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads... With zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. The body only really works well when we discover what is that area we should be operating in and we develop what that gifting is. Now, if you go to 2 Corinthians 10, and these are the only two scriptures I'm going to use uh, openly. I should just refer to the rest and it'd be good for you to check them. So as you begin to look at them, I, I don't know how you operate with the scripture, but I sit myself in the scripture and say, how does this apply to me? If you breed this by your spirit, how can you breed this into me? Wasn't that a fantastic picture that Steve showed this morning? 
of, of God seemingly breathing into Adam. That's the way I kind of picture it. How, how does this come into me? How does it develop? Who can develop me? Who can take me forward so I advance? I don't want to be still wearing diapers in my ministry after 40 years in it. Growth should be where we're heading towards. I'll just read you this from 2 Corinthians 10. Not that we dare to classify, verse 12, or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they're without understanding. Don't measure yourself against anybody else. Measure yourself against what God has entrusted to you. And ask yourself the question, is it developing or is it still the same? It has to grow. But we will not boast beyond limits, but we will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to, to, to reach even you. For we're not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labor of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in an area, another's area of influence. The whole way God has taken us in our development is he's moved us into an area where we preach the gospel and see something develop. And when we've done that, he moves us to the next area where we preach the gospel and see something develop, advancing supernaturally. That is what is going to happen. That is what Steve Jones, some of which he will talk about on Sunday night, if I've heard him correctly in some of the things he's been saying. But that will mean that everybody sitting in this room, if you're operating in this gift or ministry, needs to be on alert to develop to be able to help develop what's going to happen in the new planting and the new missional initiatives that are taken out of this sphere. Are you ready for that? Mm. Mm. This is why we have to grow. We have to grow to take in others. We have to grow because there are other places that don't have the benefit of what we've been given. We have to go because what we've been entrusted with has to be taken elsewhere. It's not just for us. It's for others. Our whole life is for others. So that's my question. Do you understand the level or gift of ministry that we carry? Just think about that for a minute. Ask yourself, what am I carrying? What did God say to me when he saved me? Did he speak specifically about a people, a place, a calling, a work? Or do I still not know? And it's okay if you still don't know. I remember the night I was saved, God spoke to me about New Zealand. I was saved November the 1st, 1970. I got to New Zealand 2000. 30 years later. The call doesn't always mean the sending. But there are things that God has spoken to you that you've yet to see come to pass. Here's my question. Who's going to help you get to what God spoke to you about? Who will be your destiny carrier to take you forward rather for you to be found in the same place in five years' time? That's discipleship in the gift. That's advancing in the gift that God has given you. Secondly, understanding what we've received. Do we understand how to handle what we receive from the Lord? Now, how many of you really do believe at heart that God speaks to you prophetically? Do you know what he's doing? There are two scriptures here. Do you know what these scriptures are? Could you move it on to the next slide? We're on point two. Great, Jeff, that's good. Do you know what Amos 3, 7 says? We'll give, we'll give the microphone to Greg. Uh, I'd have to look it up. No, no, you should know says God does nothing unless he, he reveals his secrets through the prophet to the prophet it's fairly close can anyone put it more closely than that surely the Lord God will do nothing in all the earth except he shows his secrets to his servants the prophets now that word servants is very interesting 
but it's not the most interesting word in that sentence. Does anybody know what Deuteronomy 29.9 says? Sorry, 29.29. 29. Dave, you've got it there. Do you want to read it out? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm going to test your mental capacities here. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. So here's the tension. There's a word there that occurs twice in those scriptures. What's the word? Secret. How many of you are good at keeping secrets? How many of you know the prophetic people are not very good at keeping secrets? Here's the first tension. God trusts the prophetic people with his secrets, but the prophetic people need to learn how, where, when, and who to release those secrets to. Often I, I, I see a great, I don't want to condemn anyone here, okay? But I see a great line of people <laughs> beginning to line up. Whenever we have a conference, they've got a secret, and as soon as they've got it, what do they do with it? They want to get it out. But if I was to tell you there are some secrets that I have and have carried for 40 years and have never got them out, because I've never been given permission to speak them, what would you say to that? We, we've, got, we've got so much to learn. Not, not everything that we see do we say straight away. We have to learn how to bring what God gives us. Do you ever ask yourself this question? What manifestation of the Spirit do you want me to bring this word in? That's 1 Corinthians 12, about the fourth verse. The varieties of gift and varieties of ministries, the varieties of manifestations, but each one is given by the Spirit for the good of the whole of the body. Do you ever ask the question? As a preacher, I don't find it hard. You could, you could, you could shout to me a scripture. And, and to be honest, this is not boasting. You can do this as a preacher. Any preacher can do this. We could preach. What we wouldn't know is what manifest of the station of the spirit does he want it to be brought in? Pastoral? Prophetic? Apostolic? Compassionate? Merciful? The sword? There are so many ways we've got to find of bringing what God's secrets have been put into our hearts before him in order to say, how do I bring this? Shall I give you a practical example? When, when we were younger, I used to imagine, John the Baptist was my hero. Now, Kim would remember this because she was a young lady living in our family at the time, but we'd have long hair and strange clothes, and I had some very strange clothes. And I, I would go out and I would feel like John the Baptist and I wanted to prophesy against everything and particularly against the denominations. And I, I was rejected from the denominations and ejected from them. And I had this real heart to preach against them and I would read the Gospels and I'd read how Jesus called them whitewashed walls and terrible sepul sepulchres and all these things that were wrong inside of them. And, and one day I was in full flow and the Lord said to me, you've never read the end of the chapter. And I read the end of the chapter and Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem and saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you under my wings and drawn you, but you would not. And you refused the prophets. And now it's all been taken away from you. And I began to realize I could get the word, but I needed the manifestation. Now, how many of you understand what I'm talking about here? Okay, John, I, is this clear? Any problems with this? Okay. But this is where we have to learn to submit ourselves one to, one to another and submit our revelation. Greg, what did you do with that word that God gave you this morning? When did you give it to Steve? A week ago. A week ago. What was his response? Silence for a bit. All right, silence for a bit. And then he came back and said it fits in. How did you feel during the silence? Um, 
Well, it was actually acknowledged that they've received it. So you kind of then just go, well, they've received it. It's up to them. Oh, that's interesting. That's not like many prophetic people, right? I, I, I use an illustration with prophetic people. When the newspaper boy puts the paper through my door, he doesn't come back two hours later and said, have you read it yet? Okay, he delivers it. Our job is to learn how to deliver it and then wait patiently while the word of the Lord tests us to see whether it's from him and whether it's useful. I could ask you a lot of questions, see, but I, I haven't got the time to do it. Chris, are you watching me on time? Nearly half past, that's okay. Third one, harnessing gifts of prophecy in a meeting to the leadership. Oh boy, there's a question I want to ask you here. It, it's going to make my wife a little nervous, but I think we'll be okay. How do we harness the gifts that we have of prophecy in a corporate gathering with the church leadership? Now, I want you to be dead honest with me now. How do you do that in West Oxfordshire or in this sphere? Let's call, call it this sphere. I've watched it in West Oxfordshire recently, so I have some idea. How do you harness the gift? What do you do when God has given you something in your local gathering? John, what do they do in your congregation in Carterton? Uh, do you mean just on a normal Sunday morning? On a normal Sunday morning. We would generally let people share openly on our Sunday morning. We're small enough probably that that still works. I think when we gather in a wider... Am I not so answering the question? you don't have a line? No, we don't. Okay. Why do you do that? Uh, I think... For some, it becomes a barrier. We also make sure that we uh, offer the opportunity to come and talk to a church leader if that's something that's helpful for somebody to, to share. That's good. Dave, what do you do in yours? Uh, depends on, uh, again, it depends on the, uh, what's going on in the meeting. Sometimes people will come up to the meeting leader if nothing's happened, we just then open it up a little bit. Generally, we trust to see who's there and open it up. But depending on who's in the meeting, sometimes we guard the microphone quite carefully. <laughs> I, I think, this is interesting. I, I've watched, how many of you watched The Walk of Shame? <laughs> Where someone comes all the way out? Have you, have you ever done it? Anybody ever done that here? How do you feel? It's up to God, yeah, but you feel rejected, most of you, don't you? It's, it's really hard to handle. But this, the, we, we create our own problems sometimes because of our own urgency to give the secret away. When we're seasoned, we understand much more how to discipline ourselves. The spirit of the prophets should be subject to the prophets. But I've had many people come to me and say, we can't, we can't bear this line we have to wait for. Because we lose the anointing. Did anybody relate to that one? And, and I do. Now here's, here's where we have a problem we've got to overcome. When you're trustworthy, which is what you have, you know your flock, you know your people, and so you, you're perfectly open to allowing anyone to take that microphone. What happens when you have visitors in who you don't know who want to take the microphone? They stand closer by them. We, we'll find ways of doing this. But this is a tension for prophetic people. Now, you've got to understand this. I, I work with Chris with a lot of prophets who are Ephesians 4 prophets and are prophets to nations. They're not just prophets in a local church or a region. There are different levels. Even they can discipline themselves. They don't want to, but they will subject themselves to whoever's leading the meeting and say, I'm carrying this. Does it fit? Let me just add a point here. If you're going to bring major direction to the church, which is going to change everything within the church, that's going to take it probably in the, in the opposite place to where the leaders have already been telling you they're going, don't bring it on a Sunday morning. Take it to the leaders outside of the meeting and let it be weighed, okay? Oh. I, I got first-hand experience. I got sent to Basingstoke by Barney Coombs in 1979 to tell them that they were not to divide north and south of the, of the railway line. And the leaders were all meeting in a room. I knew maybe 10 of those leaders at the time. And he sent me there 
And he, this was how he sent me. I don't think they receive me anymore, so I'm pretty sure they won't receive you. <laughs> now that's a great commission. But if you're walking in an obedient relationship with spiritual authority, you go. And I walked in the room and I, I, they, were, they had the diagrams up on the wall. I said, I've got a word from the Lord. I've been sent by Barney Coombs, but I actually sent him this word. A house that's divided against itself will fall. You divide in north and south, you divide it into two, it will fall. Do not do it. And they just stood up and to a man and a woman in that room, they said, we accept that as a word from the Lord. We didn't do it. We divided it into six and then we grew to 12 and planted another one. And the, the whole thing was saved because we went about it in obedience to the word of the Lord. But I've never been so afraid in all of my life to walk into a situation where most of them were at least 10 years older than me and have to say something like that. Now, why am I saying this? Because I still do not find that we're operating at the right times, in the right places, in the most effective way, because we've never talked these things through properly between us. And we're trying to open our understanding today. We're not trying to cut off the voice of the prophet. We're not trying to cut out the gift of prophecy. We know how important it really is. We're just trying to bring order to God's house. And when we've got order, not order, order, not that order. When we've got godly order, we'll see godly growth. Amen? Okay, I'll go fast on these two, Chris. The, the fourth one is this. This is really important. If you have an emerging, number four, if you have an emerging prophetic ministry, you must learn how to harness it alongside other five-fold ministries. The apostle and the prophet help lay the major foundations in the church. I want to challenge every one of you that's moved beyond the gift of prophecy and moving into the ministry of prophecy I want to, of the prophet. I want to challenge you to make sure that you're in harness with apostolic people. And if you're not, you will not prosper. Your ministry will grow, but your effectiveness will be extremely limited. One of the greatest sources of joy for me is to be able to harness myself with prophets from around the world and move with them regularly. The significant change we've seen within our churches in Zimbabwe in the last four or five years has been this. In the midst of all the crisis, we have exploded in growth. Because the pastors and the apostles repented over the way they had rejected and not received the prophetic people. And the prophetic people repented because of the attitude that they'd shown towards those who were pastoral. And suddenly there was a linkage between them. And I was in a gathering with Tom Bedford, David Oliver, uh, and Buck Hudson and myself in Africa when all this happened. It was an amazing move of the Holy Spirit, a sovereign move of the Holy Spirit that transformed the whole direction we were going in as a people. And from that point on, we've grown 50 churches in the last five years. It has been remarkable to see the growth. We've seen evangelists come from nowhere. We've seen something happen that we've never seen happen anywhere before, other than in the States where there's been a significant harnessing of those ministries. It would be my prayer that you find it. Read it in Ephesians. Read it in Ephesians 2, in Ephesians 3, in Ephesians 4. Read it in Acts 11. Read it in Acts 13 and see how the prophets and teachers and the local elders work together in the church in Antioch. Read it and enjoy it. The last one. Okay. Are we all right for time? The last one is very simple. I'm just scrolling through here. I have to ask myself this, this question. What has helped me as a leader with prophetic people? What, what do you think has helped me as a leader with prophetic people? Let's start with the positives. Humble, serving spirits. They don't harangue me. They've made my life easy. Even this last week, I received a prophetic word from one of our prophets in the States, one of our younger prophets. I'd spent the last six months maybe reviewing all the prophetic words over my own life and Chris's life. And he sent me this message. He had no idea what I was doing. Dave... You and Chris, the promises of God that he gave you when you were young, through the prophets, you will live to see 
come, pass, come to pass. What do you think that did for me? What do you think it did for me for the time I was sitting in front of a situation that I had no answers for and I'd done everything I knew? I prayed every way I knew. I'd fasted. I didn't see it change. And I'm sitting there one morning saying, God, what am I going to do? And Scott Squires, my email goes and there it is. And he says, Dave, I've just had a vision. You're standing in front of a, a big safe and you're turning the tumblers and you're listening so, so carefully. And you've got four of the numbers, but the fifth won't click. He said, I see a man walk into the room and he just very gently moves you to one side, goes through, turns it, opens the door, turns around, smiles, it's Jesus and he walks out. He says, leave it to him. I left it to him within one week, sorted. What do you think that does for someone like me? I don't have all the answers. I need to hear the secrets that the prophets have received. And when I hear them, I know what to do with them. The secrets that you've been given, go and share them with people who know what to do with them. Don't share them in the wrong places. Amen? What has hindered me? Well, you can guess, so I'm not going to tell you. But I would honestly suggest this, that I am where I am today and do what I do today because I love the prophets. I don't fight with them. I need them. And so I pour my life into them. And it's been part of the greatest journey of my life. And I hope that out of this room, there'll be many of us that move from the gift of prophecy, which is really important, to become prophets, people who are strategic, people who make a difference, people who get secrets from heaven that open up locked situations where other people can be set free. But to do that, You've got to do something that's not easy for the prophet. You have to learn to love people. And you have to learn to work with others. This is in my wife. Tomorrow of 51 years. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what you thought you were coming to this afternoon when it was a, a, a seminar on the prophetic. We use this phrase, the prophetic, and we've turned prophetic into a noun, a thing. And it's like an umbrella phrase, isn't it, that covers many, many aspects of prophetic ministry. Um, I, if you were to say to me, what is the prophetic? I still think in my mind a word on a Sunday morning in a meeting. That's one thing that will come very strongly to me, and it may to you. Or you may think of the Old Testament prophets, you know, with the long beard and the, the staff and the, the word to the nation. And you may think of the prophetic like that. Um, and of course, as we know, there was a tremendous shift between Old Testament prophetic and New Testament prophetic, where um, we read in 1 Corinthians 14 that now the prophetic is not locked up to prophetic ministry alone and the prophet but now the prophetic is open to all believers who are filled with the spirit of Jesus Christ so it's a real opening up in the new testament and i've been thinking just a little bit well what does that look like and if we just think of it as um, what happens on a Sunday morning, getting a word for a Sunday morning, or even getting a word for um, a, a meeting like we had last night, for example. I think that's great, and I think we need to continue with that and grow in that. But I think there is far more, there are far more ways in which we can be prophetic. And I just want to talk along those sort of lines for the next few minutes. I mean, if we look at Jesus, I guess he is the prime example of what a prophetic lifestyle looks like. And I think, you know, in these days that we are called to perhaps, for some of us it will be the prophetic ministry, but for many of us, I just wonder if we need to think a little bit more about prophetic lifestyle. Because that's how Jesus lived. And we want to be more like him. Just think about it for a minute. He said, I only do what the Father is doing. So I imagine by that, that, that what he did every morning, I guess, 
and maybe through the night too, if he had waking hours through the night, that he was in tune with what his father was saying and doing, that he knew how to hear what his father was saying. And then, of course, he was obedient to that. And that was where the anointing was. And it's very simple, really, isn't it? Because as Christians, we accept that we can hear the voice of God. I hope we can. Every Christian has the availability to hear the voice of God. Jesus, in that context of only, knew what the, of only doing what the Father was saying and doing, he knew the specific people to stop and talk to. He must have, must have passed so many people and he must have seen their need, their desperate need, their need for healing, their need for deliverance, or just the general need of hearing something of the gospel message. And yet he, he couldn't have spoken to everybody. How did he know which ones to stop and take the time with? He knew because he only did what the father was doing. And then when he was with people, he had tremendous words of knowledge into their lives. And he even knew what they were thinking. So that antennae must have been up all the time in a tremendous way. He had specific words. Go and sell all that you have. I'm coming to your house for tea. He knew what to say. Can I, can I just say something here? I think systems are very, very good. And we're hearing quite a lot of systems at the moment. Uh, like, for example, things like when you're with someone on the street, say, you can say this, this is a good opener. Um, one of them, um, I don't know, I think the turning maybe has a, a technique of approaching people. I don't know much about the turning. But th there, are, there are things put in our hands where we can actually learn how to do ice breaking with people that we meet. And treasure seekers is one that I did a little bit of. You know where you pray before you go out and you ask God to show you who he has prepared beforehand that you're going to meet and that you're going to, and it worked brilliantly and it really set me off on a phenomenal um, gift of faith in a way I'd never had that before. It was inc an incredibly useful tool. And there are questions, aren't there, that we've heard people um, suggest, things like, um, you know, if, if I could pray for you, what would you ask me to pray for? And I myself have used that once and it had tremendous opening and results. And I think, I think systems and techniques are great when we're starting out. But when I look at Jesus, the only system and technique he had, actually, was to listen to the Father and do what he was doing. And I would say, go ahead, use your techniques prophetically out, with, out on the streets with people you don't know. Use that, and it can be a great framework to get you going. But don't stay there. Be prepared to move beyond that into seeing someone that you're meeting in the street and your antennae is, is asking the question, Lord, what do I say to this person? And it will not be the same as the one you've just spoken to up the road. So there's a whole load of growing and advancing, I believe, for us in that area. No systems, only as a starter. Springboard, let me put it that way, it's a bit more positive, as a springboard. He saw what the father was doing and he knew timing, he knew when to move, he knew when to go to Jerusalem, he knew where he should be geographically and we see that in Paul as well. And can I encourage you to have your antennae up about that too? Take little nudges from God. Um, the other night we'd been working through the day, I can't remember, we'd had a pretty heavy day, and I said, Dave, I just think it'd be great if we could go out for a walk. And um, he said, well, okay then, let's go out for a walk. And as we went out for a walk, we, on the way back, Dave said, do you fancy popping into the pub for a quick pint? And I, I said, well, I look a mess, I'm soaking, it's just so, it's so sweaty and horrible, I don't really feel like it. Then I thought, wait a minute, he's got that thought, could it be from God? This is not super spiritual. This is just expecting God to move by those little nudges. And we went into the pub and there was a spare seat next to 
um, the door where we went in and we heard this voice, oh hi Chris, we've got brand new neighbours who've moved in just the other side of the hedge and we haven't, we've said hello to them, I've, I've, I've visited them and gave them a card and a plant when they moved in. Um, but we said, oh, your, your glass is empty. Would you like a refill? And they said, oh, yeah, I love this. And well, the seat next to them was free. So we said, can we join you? And we joined them and we spent about an hour with these new neighbours. Great couple. And we feel now that we've got the beginnings of a relationship with them. We got back home. We were buzzing. All I'd done was just had that little thought, shall we go out for, out for a walk? All David had done was had that little thought on the walk, <laughs> which seemed the most carnal, carnal thought. Let's pop in for a swift one. <laughs> now you could think, well, yeah, maybe. Was that God? Was it not God? Can I tell you something? The more we are intentional about following that inner voice and the more expectation we have, and I'm jumping way ahead in my notes here, the more those things will happen. And the more you will go home buzzing because you know God has arranged a divine encounter for you. That's living supernaturally and prophetically. The prophetic is like a ribbon threaded through the whole of our lives. It can be. It can be the thread running through every day, even every night. It's always there. And I think that's how Jesus lived. And that's what I want to try and grow into. So how do we do this? The first thing I want to, to say about this is, um, what can we do practically? We can maintain a healthy lifestyle. If you want to maintain a healthy lifestyle physically, then you will try and eat the right food. You might do exercise. There are things you can do. So what can we do to maintain a healthy lifestyle um, uh, prophetically? The first thing... Um, that I would say is to develop a deepening love for the Word of God. Not just knowledge that we know what's in here. I want to know what's in here. I do want knowledge of the Word. But I want far more than that. I want to love this Word in such a way that it is life to me as I read it. That it stirs up challenge and that Jesus can speak to me through it. I want to be hungry for the word of God in a way that I'm hungry for food three times a day. Jesus' whole life was based on the word. He was a fulfillment of the prophetic word. <laughs> he resisted evil by standing on the word. He lived in the word. He was the word. If we as prophetic people just go by the wind... We will become very flaky. And there's a temptation just to go by the wind. Because it's the easy option. It's easy just to walk to a meeting and see a flower by the side of the road. And say, God, are you speaking to me about that? And to go into the pre-prayer meeting and say, on the way to the meeting this morning, I saw a picture of a flower and I feel God is saying this. It's easy to do that. And it's not wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. But I want to call you higher than doing that. There is far more for us to move on from, from doing that. And it could be that the Lord would, would give you the most profound, profoundest of words by the flower by the side of the road. But if that's all we're doing and we're relying on this spontaneous seeing things and then bring in a prophetic word off it. If we're satisfied with that, then it's going to hinder us from growing into a deeper thing. And the word of God and the love of the word of God is going to be part of a way in which we can actually go deeper into God. There is, I, I wonder, a drawing away a little bit from the word of God. I don't know if this is to do with the fact of we don't carry our Bibles around necessarily in the way that we used to because we've got it all on our phones. And it may, I don't know whether there's something going on that is slightly negative as well as being incredibly positive and helpful. Just check yourself about the way you are reading the Word of God and, and how you are allowing it to um, interact 
with you and that you're interacting with it. Don't let's just go by the wind of the Spirit. In Hebrews 3.10, it talks about Israel going astray because they didn't know the ways of the Lord. The only way we're going to know the ways of the Lord is to know his word and to interact with it and to uh, learn that way. Learn, read it until it speaks to you. If it's going to be just a, like a reading a chapter a day, or if it's going to be reading it for half an hour, I would suggest if that's where you're at, then that's better than nothing. But I would say read it until it speaks to you. Read it until it's life to you. Read it until you hear God speaking through it. And that's not just one way. It's often out of the reading of the word that God can speak prophetically to you. I, I had one of my uh, deepest encounters with Jesus through reading of the word. It wasn't, I love waiting on the Lord. I love soaking in the spirit, love what we did. Don't think that I'm not, I'm not negating that at all, but I'm trying to put something foundational in. I was reading about the woman at the well. And I've read it many, many times before. And in my mind's eye, I could see the woman at the well sitting next to Jesus. And it was a really wonderful picture. And I just felt the Lord say, I want you to come and sit with me by this well. And instead of the woman by the well, it was like I was walking up to that well to meet with Jesus. And I sat with him. And it was a profound moment. And it's a place that I can go back to, to sit with him and listen to what he's saying into my life. But it was through a reading of the word that this came. It's based not on pure imagination, although I believe God gave us imagination to use. But I think if we're just using our imagination and sensing the Holy Spirit, and we don't have this in place, we could end up a little bit flaky. Secondly, a deepening relationship with Jesus or the Father or the Holy Spirit. Didn't quite know what to put there. Can I read you a quote? This quote I heard from an American guy called Jeremy Pingle. You won't know him. He's one of the churches that we visit regularly. And he said this. He said, between the altar and the throne, therein lies the voice of God. Quite deep, isn't it? (laughs) Between the altar and the throne, therein lies the voice of God. Now, I'm sure the voice of God is in other places as well. But when I heard that, I felt I wanted to discover what that place was. The altar is a place of worship. It's where we lay ourselves bare before the Lord. It's a place of sacrifice. It's a place of falling down before him. A place of complete surrender. That's the altar. And the throne is a place of his decrees. His authoritative word being spoken forth into the earth. His proclamations. His word being spoken into the kingdoms of this earth, the throne. It's a place of encounter and change. If we find a place between the altar and the throne, we will not remain the same. If we find a place between the altar and the throne, we are going to know a fresh anointing of God on what we bring prophetically. Because we will have been with him and will have been in that place that is beyond any place we could manufacture ourselves. It's a place of revelation. Do we want to know more about what God is doing in this world or what he wants to do? Do we want to be messengers of that? Then I would suggest that we need to explore the possibility of being in this place between altar and throne. It's about knowing him, not just knowing about him. It's about being with him, 
not just talking to him. So just something to think about. If this could be the source of our prophetic, what is the source of your prophetic at the moment? Where do you get your prophetic from? How does it come? There'll be lots of different answers to that. For many of us, it'll be in the worship. That's where, that's where I just seem to hear God when we're worshiping. Where is your source? Thirdly, and it's been mentioned already, love, love for people. I don't think I need to say too much about this. Jesus loved people. He had compassion on the crowd. My most powerful words have been given to people that I actually have a love for. I've noticed that. It's, or you can be praying with someone and then as you're praying with them, you just feel such a love for them. When we can bring the prophetic out of a place of loving the person or loving the people that we're ministering to, then we're more likely to carry it in, a, in grace. We're more likely to carry it in a way that Jesus himself would deliver it because he is full of compassion and love and grace for people. There's a wonderful little phrase in 2 Corinthians 6 where Paul talks to the Corinthians about, he says, Our, my heart's really wide open to you. He loved the people. There's so much, there's so much um, uh, evidence of the way Paul enjoyed being with people and loving people, just wonderful. And he says here, my heart is open to you. Corinthians, open your heart wide also. And I thought, great, it's in the Bible. If it's a command like that, if it's a suggestion, whatever, is, whatever it is, it's there. It must be possible to achieve. And so it can be a prayer, Lord, help me love people more. And I was saying to Dave before this, um, this seminar, I so, Dave, you know, sometimes prophetic people do not necessarily have a love for people. They can be quite loners. You know, quite, I, I have a limit as to when I can be with people. I'm, I'm an introvert that gets very easily filled up with people, and I just have to go away and find a quiet space. It isn't that I don't like people. It's just that they wear me out. <laughs> And others of you, yeah, well, some of you will be like that. Others, it just energizes you being with people. As prophetic people, we have to learn to love people so that what we give carries the grace of God. Just want you to think about, I want to ask you a question here, just to jot down. How many marks out of 10 would you give yourself in loving people? Just think, think at a moment. If one is extremely low and you want to be on your own all the time and you don't really like people at all, and 10 is Jesus. <laughs> what, number, what number would you give yourself? Nobody's going to look at that. But there is a question that goes with it. What can I do about it? What can I do about it? So those are three things that uh, are healthy, can help with a healthy lifestyle. So how can we actually grow? I want to give you three practical things, and then uh, hopefully there'll be time for a question. I'll try and go through this quite quickly. First of all, increase expectation. It's interesting, we were driving here this morning, and... Um, Day, uh, this big lorry comes around a bend, and I said, oh, that was a bit fast, wasn't, wasn't it? Good job you were driving relatively slowly. And Dave used this phrase I never heard him say before. He said, um, I, I was driving in it with expectation. Is that what you said? I was driving with expectation. And I just want to say, do we live with expectation? Just don't you think a moment, if you were a disciple, one of the 12 disciples, and you're walking around with Jesus, you were one of the, the, one of the, the 12, and you would go to sleep at night, you wake up in the morning, in the morning, what would you expect in the day? You've just woken up, you've had a good night's sleep, you had a great day yesterday, saw a few healings and a few miracles, and... 5,000 people were fed out of five loaves and two fish. 
What would you expect as you woke up? Just shout something out. The unexpected. I think that covers it all, really. Unexpected. Anything else? More of the same. Yes. So she could say more of the same. It would have to be different, though, each day, I guess. Sorry? Ask God, what do you want to do today? I, I don't think you would have it all sewn up, would you, what was going to happen? Because I think life was full of surprises traveling with Jesus. Um, things were not repeated very much. There were always new things going on. Um, there was a gradual progression of a crowd being uneasy and Pharisees and all the rest of it. You didn't really know, and I think that's right. The first answer was probably the umbrella answer to expect the unexpected. So what's different for you? What's different for us? When we wake up in the morning, don't we wake up with Jesus? Have we not given our lives to him? Are we not full of the Holy Spirit? Are we not expectant that Jesus is going to use us? So what's different waking up without an expectation? We should wake up every morning with an expectation that something's going to happen. I had a weird, weird week in the Lake District a few years ago, and I still am not fully sure what was going on. We were in a little cottage up a farm track, and we went to this farm, farmhouse. We'd stayed there lots of times. This particular week, I call it my weird week in the Lake District. I would just be reading something in a book, and, uh, or I'd, be, I'd have a thought, and I would, it would happen. It was really weird. So... One of the things was we were walking through one of the Keswick or somewhere, and I remember saying to Dave, it's interesting in the Lake District, you never see any women in high heels, do you? They're always wearing walking boots here and, you know. And then this woman just went right in front of me with a pair of white stilettos on. And it was like I had a thought and something happened that was totally out of the ordinary and then I said another day I said Dave it's really odd isn't it the fact that I'm surprised that the lady who runs his farmhouse hasn't got a dog um, I don't know why I would say that we went back that night and we'd been going years to this same woman and there was a dog outside the front door and I said oh that's interesting that you've got a dog and she said oh yeah somebody's just dropped a dog off for me to look after and I thought, it's funny, I was just saying this morning, how weird that, that you know, so, that it's not, there's no dog. Well, this was happening every day, and it was beginning to freak me out. As I thought, I'm scared what I think. There's a link here between me thinking things and things, seeing things happening, like within an hour. Or, well, we were going home one night, and um, we had a good day, and we were, we were driving home, and... I had heard um, Catherine Ruanala, some of you may know Catherine, I think she's been in, in Oxford. She had told a, a story of being on a plane and she said, always be aware to pray, open to pray with people. And she told a story of a man being on the opposite side of the owl and the aisle, and he had, not the owl, the aisle, and he had some sort of seizure. And they're all medics and uh, stewards and, and, and so everybody around this man. But it was looking serious. And she just said, okay, I need to do something here. She put her hand out and she just said, I'm just going to pray for this man. I'm a pastor. Just pray for this man. She prayed. He was immediately sick and then he was fine. Oh, I didn't like the first bit, but anyway. And I was thinking about this coming back from our day in the Lake District. And I said to the Lord, just to myself, but I could live a whole lifetime and never be in a situation like that. We turned around the corner and we were immediately stopped in the road. And there was one car in front of us, that car turned away. So we were the first in the road and we said, what's happened? They said, there's an accident in the road and there's somebody lying in the middle of the road. I've got goosebumps thinking about this. So... Dave said, I'll get out the car, you stay in the car. I said, no, no, I've got to get out of the car. It was, it, that was very weird because this is so opposite. He thought, what has happened to my wife? Because he knew nothing about the process. And I said, you stay in the car. This is my accident. 
So I went round the corner thinking, what on earth am I doing? And what am I going to do, more to the point? And there was this guy in leathers in the middle of the road. And I thought, now what do I do? And I just went up to him. And there was just one person there. I said, excuse me, I'm a pastor. Oh, very, I mean, I didn't know what to say. I thought that was the easiest thing to try and explain. Um, I went up to him and I just put my hand, I, I remember the touch on his leathers. I remember that. It's funny what you remember. And I just said, you're right, mate. What's your name? <laughs> and he said, Jim or whatever. And I said, you're going to be all right. I thought, what are you saying? He could have a broken neck. I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> That's what Catherine said, so I just said the same thing. I'm a pastor, and I'm just going to pray with you. Is that okay? Yeah. And I prayed with him, and I said, you're going to be okay, and walked away. Walked back to the car and started to shake, thinking, what happened? What happened? I'll tell you, that doesn't happen every day. But the more we expect the unexpected, the more the unexpected will happen. Expect it. Look for him. Pursue encounters. And as you pursue encounters, the more you pursue them and put yourself in a place where you're expecting them to happen, the more they will pursue, pursue you. Like the other night going to the pub. I don't pursue them in the same way now. Only when I feel I'm getting a bit stale. But it's because I've trained myself to pursue prophetic encounters. How would you mark yourself out of ten? On your expectation. If one is low and ten is high. What is your expectation for prophetic encounters in the day to day? Secondly, raise awareness of who you are and what's going on. Which kingdom are you most aware of? The natural kingdom or the kingdom of heaven? I'm learning to be more aware of an open heaven. I expect that wherever I go, that there is an open heaven wherever I go, which means that I have access to whatever it is that God wants to give me, where I, whether it's into a local supermarket or into the job that you do, into the school you work in, wherever it is. Do, are you aware of an open heaven over you? Are you aware that the Holy Spirit is resting on you, that is within you? That same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's no less powerful than the moment Jesus rose from the dead. It's the same spirit. Ha! The same spirit. We don't have a watered down version of the Holy Spirit that's a little spirit like this. And this was the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. It's the same spirit. It's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Not in a Sunday morning, in wherever you are, nine to five on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's the same spirit there. Are you aware of that? If we were really, really conscious of that, what difference would it make when we meet people? I'm a child of God, full of the Spirit of God. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to worry about rejection. I can bring the Word of God into that situation. Do I get fearful sometimes? Yes, I do. I have to remind myself of this. But what are you aware of? I know there is an open heaven over the road that we've moved into just over a year ago. It's like I can see the heavens open over these neighbors. I don't have to do anything. It's just happening. Time after time. Pray for an open heaven over your neighborhood and then expect to move in the spirit. Be aware of who you are. You are a gate, a catalyst through which divine resources will flow. The neighbors said to me, I said, I remember saying to one of them, I said, this is the most friendly neighborhood. We have been so welcomed. And she said, oh, it wasn't like this before you came here. I said, wasn't it? I said, everybody's great. She said, I was in my house three months before my neighbor came to say hello. I was miserable in this road. It's only now that I'm happy. There's an open heaven over us. Key to growing. Ask Father, what are you doing like Jesus did? Or what would you say to this person? Had a wonderful 
experience. We have a cake cafe in the village. Oh, I need to stop. We have a cake cafe in the village, which is a great meeting point. And uh, just go there and you eat absolutely divine cake and drink lots of coffee. So it's not a hardship going there. It's not like the usual missionary trip, but it does work as a missionary trip in our village. And I was saying to the lady over the other side of the table, I've got a book for book group, but I don't know if the ladies will like it because it's about, uh, it's, a, it's a novel, but it's about Quakers. And the lady next to me said, oh, I'm a Quaker. And so we got, that's an opening. So she said, yes, she said, I don't really believe that there's a God, not um, like an entity of a God, but she said, I believe there's God in every one of us, and that's the good in every one of us, so I try and lead a good life. And I'm smiling inside, very benignly to this dear lady, and then uh, smiling outside, but inside I'm thinking, Lord, give me the words to speak into this. Then she turned to me, she said, you're a different religion, aren't you? I don't know what they think about us in the village. I mean, somebody thought I was in part, part of the convent that we have there. and they, they can't work us out at all. Quite like that, actually. And, and I, so I said, well, I got saved in the Methodist Church in Whitney, actually. And I gave her the whole of my testimony. And I said, part of my testimony is that I tried to do good all my life. And God showed me that it was as filthy rags. Well, I could tell her that. Because I wasn't saying, oh, you shouldn't think that, you know, that you're good. It was my story. It was my testimony. And I said, and in that moment, God came down and he was as near to me as you are right now. She said, I've got a book you might like to read. It's about the Quakers. So I'm reading that book and I will go to her little cottage and I will speak to her about the issues that were raised. It's so easy. It's so easy to be prophetic if we will have an expectation. Finally, practice seeing, hearing, and doing. I've got some amazing glasses here. I can't see a thing. Uh, they're supposed to be fly glasses to give you lots of different views. I can't see a thing. I just wanted to put them on to say, practice seeing, so when you go about and you think, well, how can I grow? Just say, Lord, show me. Show me. What are you doing? Show me something, Lord. I woke up in the, <laughs> I woke up in the middle. Oh, dear me. I woke... <laughs> you haven't all gone, have you? You are still there. <laughs> no photos, please. <laughs> I woke up in the middle of the night about six months ago and I, I will be honest um, although we're living in Oxford I'm not a very big thinker I'm not a very clever thinker um, I'm quite a practical thinker and um, so I, I don't think big deep thoughts and I was on my way to the loo at about three o'clock as as is my want and on the way there I found myself saying Lord what are you doing on the earth? And I thought, oh, what, am I, what am I saying? And I immediately had this picture of the land with arrows and war going on. And underneath, life was bubbling away in little, like geezers. And I thought, thank you, Lord. Went to the loom, went back to sleep. Do we ask the Lord to show us what he's doing? Or are we happy with a flower on the way to church. Uh, these, are, these are great, these. I will finish with them. Well, does it still work? All right, let's try them. Some of you are better at hearing than seeing. Some of you see pictures and see things. That's great. That's me. I do that. Some of you are good at hearing. If you are good at hearing, better at hearing, can I urge you to ask the Lord about seeing things? And if you're good at seeing, can I ask you to, to seek the Lord about hearing? Have your big ears on. Lord, what are you saying? Maybe as you're reading the word. Oh, I can't see my notes now. Um, I, I wanted to do that just...
as a reminder. You are carrying a prophetic message. Practice hearing what God is saying. I'm going to finish there. Uh, can I just finish with a story? I saw this on YouTube. It's from one of the churches. Um, put it on. There was a lady on a bus. And as she was going on the bus, she felt the Lord say, I want you to get off at the next stop. And she felt the word peace. I don't know if has anybody seen this clip. So she got off the, at the next stop. And there was a, a rough sleeper by the, on the pavement. And she went over to him and she said, does the word peace mean anything to you? And she didn't, she didn't enlarge on it. She didn't try and make it fancy. She gave specifically. Wish there was time to talk about that. Give in exactly what God gives you. Don't try and make it sound better. Don't try and make it sound longer. If it's one word, give one word. She went up and said, does the word peace mean anything to you? And he just goes. And he got peace tattooed on his wrist. So she said, do you know the Prince of Peace? And he said, no. So she introduced him to the Prince of Peace. It may be that after seeing and after hearing, there may be a doing. Do it. Have an adventure of being obedient to your own prophetic word. And as you do it, you're going to see amazing things happen in people's lives. Because the Lord is very big on obedience. Let's stand up now and just pray. Lord, we just want to say thank you that we can dare to believe that you will use us, that it's your plan, that we are ambassadors for you. Not one of us in this room is left out of that. Lord, we want to be useful. We want our lives to count for you. We want to please you. We pray, Lord, that we would enter into something bigger something further and something deeper than where we are already. We ask for an increase of anointing upon our lives. Father, we pray that we would hear you, that our ears would be enlarged to what you are saying. Help us be more aware of your kingdom than the earthly kingdom. That we can be gates, mouthpieces, vehicles for you to speak into a very needy world. We ask that we might grow, we might mature. Lord, would you remind us that humility is paramount that we don't draw to ourselves or put ourselves in a place of taking any of the glory, but that we glorify the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.